Hi, welcome to the NPR Network and the Boas 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 podcast with your hosts Keith McPeak and myself Warren Booth. This podcast is dedicated to all things Boas and on today's show we will be talking with Vin Russo. We hope you enjoy it. So Warren, I haven't uh, talked to you too much since the last show. Uh, what's been going on with you lately? You know, it's just uh, it's just the same that has been going on for the last uh, kind of couple of months. So I'm in Virginia at the moment. Um, I've been here for the last week, and then I'm here for another couple of days, and I'll drive back to uh, to Tulsa. But this is my last trip back and forward. Um, as of June seventh, we will be leaving Tulsa and moving to Virginia. So nice. uh, I'm kind of I'm not going to uh, miss the thousand and thirty two mile drive. Yeah. Each way. Um, and all of my animals, well, with the exception of my arboreals, which I've mentioned before, they're all at a friend's place in Knoxville. All so I get, well. they're all doing great. Yeah. We've got a, a clutch of Darwin's carpets and the, we're letting the female maternally incubate those. Cool. Um, but everything else looks good. We might have a couple of gravid Costa Rican tea positives. Um, cool. And everything else is just ticking over. So it's, um, it's going well. We, we, I think we, we might have a gravid Trinidad tree boa as well. So oh, she's nice. doing um, other than that, everything's just kind of ticking over, you know. So, I did buy something new. I said I wasn't going to buy anything, and I got a pair of um, Het T positive children's pythons from uh, Nick Mutton. I've got I've gone oh, on this weird Antaresia kind of thing lately, and uh, I've got a bunch of those, but um, they'll be fun to play with. But other than that, you know, things are just kind of ticking over, you know. So, and well, of course, the other thing is we 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 sold our house yesterday in Tulsa, which is good. Oh, fantastic! So we the stress level has now decreased yeah. dramatically. You know, how about you? Very you've good. been traveling, and you've yeah, bought some yeah. We've been uh, bouncing around. <laughs> we went to yeah. uh, visit Ari and Quetzal and Ryu in uh, Texas, and uh, we got to stay with them for five or six days, checking out Replandia, hiking their property. I found out what chigger bites are. <laughs> they were not <laughs> pleasant. <laughs> they tore me up. Those things. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I gotta, I gotta be smarter and I wanna wear my pants more often when I'm walking um, yeah. through tall grass. Uh, yeah, so that um, checking out a lot of stuff there. They had some species there that I was unaware of. You know, different lacertas and you know, Ryu is into some obscure species. So that was really cool to check out some stuff that yeah. you kind of hear of, but you don't really think about. And then when you see it in person, you're like, wow, that is really cool, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I did that. And like you said, I picked up some um, Lanthanotus borneensis. So I got some earless monitors now I'm working with. Those things are really cool. Definitely wow. fell in love with them. It's really nice to have an animal. You just got to feed earthworms, too. <laughs> not have to buy mice and chase down rats and all that kind of stuff. So are they uh, are they pretty sensitive? You know, like um, if you're traveling for a week, you know, do you have someone that's going to look after them? And... Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's simple enough um, with uh, the worm feeding. You know what I mean? I, I Anybody really that I'm associated with in the area is either a fisherman or something. So they got no problem <laughs> dropping yeah. in a few worms every day, you know? So yeah, yeah, that'll work out well. And uh, I actually reached out to our guest tonight, Vin Russo, today because I have a uh, gravid Argentine boa that uh, you know starting to lay inverted, and she's looking like she's getting close. And I'm a terrible record keeper, so I bounced <laughs> off Vin. How long generally? And he's like, you know, just like anything else, usually around 120 days. So I'm about five days, six days off of that. So. Um, you know, it was good to see that just her tell signs were telling me she's getting close and then Vin kind of confirmed it. So that was cool. How can you not be a good record keeper, given the essays that you post on Facebook? <laughs> I thought that you would have these like, detailed notebooks of every day in the snake room. You know, I, I'm real good at getting my thoughts down quickly writing. But when it comes to talking or record keeping or any like I, I fall way short. I try to let you and Rob do all the talking on here. You guys are naturals. I, I kind of fall to the wayside with that stuff. But luckily tonight we got Vin. He's going to uh, definitely give us a lot of good information, keep the conversation rolling. Yeah. I'm enjoying the background there, Vin. I think I've said to you before, I play bass as well. So uh, I have way too many of them. And yeah, Vin, Vin, is, uh, Vin is definitely a man of many talents. I see that he's into bonsai. 
He's a musician, which makes me very jealous. I'm always jealous of all you guys that can play an instrument. Uh, he's a fantastic snake keeper. I see he's got koi. He's an avid fisherman. I'm trying to think of what else he does. <laughs> he's got way too much time on his hands. I think that's what he's got. Way too yeah, much time on his hands. It, it, it's funny. One of my friends said that to me. He's like, oh, you got too much time on your hands. And he, he's like, you know, every time I see you, you you're sending, sending me pictures of fishing. I said, dude, you got to understand. I go fishing between 6 and 8 in the morning, and then I go to work at 9. I'm like, right. what are you doing at 6 to 8 in the morning? You're probably laying in bed. <laughs> so you got to make the time. Well, that's true. Yeah, very cool. Well, Vin, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks, glad man. to have you. And uh, I know Warren's got some good questions for you, but I was just uh, hoping maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself or anybody that maybe is living under a rock and doesn't know who you are in the hobby. <laughs> well, I've been doing this almost my whole life. So um, I specialize, obviously, in boas and that's something I've been doing since I'm a kid. Um, <clears throat> started out um, doing mostly colubrids and Burmese pythons. Um, that's how I met you, Keith. Um, I was at Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Wow. Yeah. Leonard Knapp had that show. Uh -huh. And um, you had um, your, uh, like, calico-looking berm on your table. Yeah, yeah. And I ended up buying um, a pair of its... I think siblings. I think they were siblings. Probably. Yeah, yeah. probably. And um, it was an albino male and a, a het female. And I was like, you know, hoping, oh, maybe they'll make one, but they didn't. Right. Yeah, never, that project never panned out. Right. Well, we, we know now that it's yeah completely random. But, and I don't think I, I don't think I paid much more for them than what they would have been worth as, you know, normal right. albino and het anyway. So it wasn't like you were you know, trying to, you know, right. sell them on, on the fact that they were the siblings to that, right. that calico. So, but that's a long time ago. And the berms were where I, you know, started making some money and realizing, wow, I can, I could, uh, do this as a, you know, a part-time thing. And I noticed the boas made more money because not a lot of people were breeding boas. And I had a little recipe for boas back then that worked pretty good and i still use the basic basic res recipe to this day so. mm -hmm. um, but you know other than that i have uh two books that i wrote for uh for um eco publishing the um the complete boa and the more complete boa and if uh if anybody doesn't know what those books are you should go get one <laughs> yeah Pretty much the Bible, yeah. Yeah, good stuff. So, so the bow is mainly you got drawn into that mainly because you were looking at this as a business at that time, or were you doing field work at that time, or? No, the bow is for me started as a kid. I mean, literally a child. Um, I traded a friend in school uh, a horned frog because back in the eighties, when I was like fourteen. 15 i worked in a pet store and they got in surname horn frogs which which are the little brown the brownish orangish looking ones and um they were wild caught and i said to my boss if that thing eats i want to take it i'll, I'll buy it from you and it ate a, a leopard frog i'm like i definitely want it because they wouldn't eat anything else other than other frogs when they first came out of the wild. so mm -hmm. to make a long story short i got the frog i established it and my, one of my friends in, in high school was like, I want that frog. I'm like, well, I want that boa that you have. He had a really nice Colombian boa. And I had a couple of nice Colombian boas at the time too. So it was a nice uh, male. And I traded him the frog for the, for the, horn, for the, for the boa. And uh, I think the next, the next season, I guess it would have been spring for me. They were my that male was breeding one of the females I had, and she had babies that summer. And I remember as a kid selling them to pet stores, I think I was 15, 16, and seeing that wow, these things uh, they have a value to them, and people want them. You know, they weren't easy to get back then. I think I got 75 bucks a piece for them, and that was like 1984. 
um, that was a lot of money. You know, I think I had mm -hmm. 20 of them. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it made me realize this, this could be a business one day. Cause back then nobody was really breeding snakes um, as a living. It was all hobbyist, right. you know? So, and again, I didn't just jump into it then and say, oh, I'm going to breed snakes for a living. I, I went into the corporate world as a young man. I worked, I started w working for an appraiser when I was young because I went to college um, for business management. I worked for an appraiser. Then I worked for um, a real estate office. Then I worked for a mortgage bank and I eventually had my own mortgage bank. And um, that whole time I was breeding snakes, collecting snakes and, um, you know, cre creating a, a collection of animals that eventually um, I had to go to my accountant and say, you know, people are writing me checks for snakes. I got to start declaring this. So I incorporated in, I think, 1990, I forget, early 90s, and um, started doing cutting edge herpetological and Prior to that, my brother and I had a pet store too back in the in the eighties, a reptile store. So I, I knew that there was something, something to this business that that could be done. And and luckily, the business I created, breeding mostly boas, was paying off. And I got to the point where I could stop my day job, which was mortgage banking, and go right into the the snakes. So, at what point did you um, start getting into um, kind of the localities and the rarer kind of um, morphs? Well my, well, my brother and I had the, the store back in 86, 87. Um, we were going to the wholesalers and buying snakes. And there was a guy in Manhattan, Big Apple Reptile, mm -hmm. um, which was Alfred Ojeda. Did you know him, Keith? He's still at White yeah. Yeah. Um, he had a store on 93rd and 3rd, which was all the way uptown. And it was in the basement of an aquarium, a fish store. And he, I guess he rented some space from the guy. And he would bring in Guyana boas, Suriname boas, um, sometimes Mexican boas. And I would weed through them. And he, he brought in some Honduran boas once. were really cool looking. I mean, really orange. Um, so, you know, as a young young guy i was like wow these these wild caught boas are really cool and back then nobody knew the differences nobody knew that the the surnames and the guyanans were constrictor and that the other stuff was imperator they just called them all boa constrictors you know um even the sides i remember seeing said boa constrictor on them even for the yeah. honduran stuff yeah. so i got into it and was like wow this is really cool and then my brother and I met a herpetologist who worked in the local university near us in Hofstra, a guy named Dr. Robert Price. Um, he would come to the store and buy rats and mice for his snake collection. And he also had a snake collection in the college. And um, a, a, another guy I knew came in who, um, do you guys have that book, um, The Captive, The Reproductive? Husbandry of Pythons and Boas. Right, by Dick Ross, Ross and, and Jerry Marzak. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Jerry Marzak so, would come into our store too. And mm -hmm. um, he would buy mice and rats for his collection because he didn't, he lived not too far from our store also. He was at the time uh, a detective. And he would come in undercover from whatever job he was doing. Like once he had long hair, once he had short hair, once he had a mustache, <laughs> once he didn't, you know. <laughs> so we, my brother and I became good friends with him. Um, and he, he came to us and said... Um, that a shipment of boas came in from Peru and then it had been um, confiscated by uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife because it didn't have the proper paperwork. Because back then, um, Tumbes and Peru had a border dispute. So the snakes came from Tumbes, but they were shipped out from Peru. So there was some discrepancy in the paperwork. So they ended up with um, the Staten Island Zoo. And I knew a guy there named Andrew Verhe who um, was running the, the reptile house at the time. That was like, again, 86, 87. And um, he said he he would give us some because then nobody wanted them. He said they were these ugly black boas. Nobody wants them. <laughs> so I was like, I'll take them. 
So I think we got about 10 of them. And that turned out to be Longicata. What had happened was um, the PhD, um, Dr. Robert Price, saw them. And I told him, I said, there's something about these snakes. They're different. Yeah, they're jet black. Because these were wild-caught big adults, like five feet, four or five feet. Um, and I said the the one of the males was trying to breed a female, and his hemipenis was out. And it was like 12 inches completely out of the male, this big purple hemipene. So I said to the, the Dr. Price, I said, there's something going on. These males have really long tails and they have really big hemipenes. So we started probing all of them. And then we compared the probing depths with all the other snakes I had at the time. I had a big collection, mostly constrictor at the time. So the constrictor males, the deepest they probed was like 20 scales. And the longicorda males probed like 40 scales. Oh, wow. deep. Wow. So um, Dr. Ooh. Robert Price... You know, I'm trying to make a long story short because I don't want to bore people. But Dr. Robert Price knew a taxonomist named um, Sam McDowell who worked at the Museum of uh, of um, which one? The one in the city Museum of Natural History. Natural History. Yeah. The Natural History Museum. He was a taxonomist, and he was a world-renowned taxonomist. He had uh, done the classification on the coelacanth. Hmm. So Dr. Price calls him up and tells him, "I think we found a new." subspecies of boa so we had to sacrifice one of the snakes and preserve it and bring it to the museum which is it gotta still be there and yeah, I um, <clears throat> and um you know sam mcdowell said to us you know the boa differs from its neighboring snakes by you know this that and the other thing and we did a whole meristic study on it and Dr. Price described it as a new subspecies in a in a scientific journal called The Snake. Yeah, I need to. I was trying to get a copy of that today. Um, I couldn't find a copy, but I'm sure you probably have a copy, Vin. You could... I believe it or not, I have I have no copies of the original with the with the the snake on the cover, the the picture of the longicorn on the cover. My brother had one, and Dr. Price had one. My brother, I got divorced twice, so it's gone. Um, I've got a couple of paperback copies of it that that I can probably send you. I've got one or two that I can send. Even a, even if, if you scan it or something, you know, it'd be cool to have that. Oh, I have a PDF of it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I can email yeah. it to you. Um, so that's how I got started into to locality boas. You know, I, I was seeing them coming out of the wild, and then my brother and I. Um, he had some fish contacts and we were, you know, most of the fish guys back then were getting the cool stuff because I guess they were out looking for fish and they'd find boas and they'd ship them out. So um, the basis of my original collection of snakes was based on all that stuff. I would, I would tell my brother, you're not selling this one. We're keeping these, you know? Wow. Hey Finn, on the on the longicata, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Warren. I just have a quick question on the longicata. Um, did you kind of talk about those at the Orlando show before it became the Daytona show? I remember to talking to somebody about a newly found boa, and they were like, their heads on some of the adults turn blue as they age, and 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 I can't remember who the fellow was I was talking to, and then I started thinking, I'm like, I wonder if that was even Vin that I was talking to back then. It probably was because not too many people had them, you know. Yeah. Um, the first guys that got them from me was um, a guy named Joel Rosen. You guys know him? That name is familiar. Yeah. Joel Rosen was a guy here in Long Island who owned a, a Chevy dealership, and he was one of these guys that was very into, a very eccentric collector. He had a lot of a nice collection of snakes, mostly boas and pythons. And I know he he had gotten some from me, and he eventually bred them because there was like a Joel Rosen line out for a little while. And I remember getting some some of those back, not from Joel, but from a guy named Edelbrock on the West Coast. So think about it in the like early nineties, when that show first came out, I guess the mm -hmm. first, the first Orlando show was 89 or 90. I forget the date. Yeah. 89, but, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the only guys that had them were probably me, this guy, Joel, and maybe one other guy on the West coast. So there weren't many around um, at the time. 
So, and I did, I did breed them and did sell babies from my, the original wild ones. And I still have animals that go back to those exact animals. So, so uh, were, were other imports brought in from that region over time or was that first group, the only group brought in? You know, Crutchfield got in a shipment of them sometime in the late 90s because I had purchased a bunch from him too, mm -hmm. just to add some more to my collection. But they were slightly different from the ones I had gotten um, from that um, confiscated shipment in 1987 or 88. I forget the exact date. Mm -hmm. um, they were a little different. They were, they, you know, some of those yellow and black ones were from the Crutchfield stuff I had gotten. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the stuff from the original shipment were darker and blacker and brown. Some of them were browner. Um, but, you know, you got to keep in mind the range of that snake is unknown. But when I was in Ecuador, I met a person who owned a um, serpentarium in Quito, Ecuador. Maria Elena, she has a, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's called the Vivarium. Mm -hmm. And um, she showed me some snakes that were collected in Ecuador that were very similar to Longicata, almost identical. Yeah. So their range probably does trip a little bit into, into Ecuador. And amazing enough, amazingly enough, she had snakes also that resembled Ortoni that were collected in ecuador too mm -hmm. so you know at one point a few guys were saying oh well longicard is really an ortoni but they're not they're very di they scale count differently and they have different colors and they come from a completely different environment mm -hmm. but the what i'm getting at is the range of those animals could be they could differ from each part of their range so i think the ones that crutchfield got may have been from the ecuador part of their range mm -hmm. i don't know he probably doesn't even know either. It's so long ago. Um, but I did get a, a few of those, so I, I bred those into my line too. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I don't know of any other um, shipment of them that came in. But I wasn't watching for it. You know, I'm not like – I wasn't like the BOA police. So what's the next shipment coming in? Who knows? They could have. Yeah, the reason I ask is when I look at um, some of the animals in Europe, you know, the, the zero line – from Herman Stokel and and then just this past year or two, I've seen equivalent looking animals popping up from breedings here in the U S I think Scott Miller produced some. Well, uh, I, I make them. The zero line came from me. Oh, came from you. Okay. Right. Yeah. I wasn't Herman aware of bought that. a bunch of snakes for me and he produced zeros before I did, but he got them. The zeros came from animals he got from me and mm -hmm. I produced zeros a few times. I have them now. I've had, I've had cool. them for a couple for years right. um i just didn't make a big deal out of them because they don't look they're not like what i like i like the the wild type i don't want the morph thing you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm not knocking them in any way i have them i have a bunch of them mm -hmm. um but you know as a locality breeder guy you're you're like you're trying to duplicate what we see in the wild you right. know so the the zeros don't really I put I just call them patternless. I think yeah. the first one I made was like two thousand and eight or nine. And I think Herman made them the same year or the year before or something like that. I forget. Yeah, I think they're interesting in that they're a pure locality morph. Right. So for people that like morphs but they, they don't want to um, you know, they're not into the locality crossing, then I think it's a pretty interesting way to get into that. Given that you've also got the anarthristic and, you know, you've got the um, kind of the high yellow line and so on. I think right. it's, a, it's a, it's a, and I'm curious whether it's actually a species or whether it's a subspecies. You know, I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it turned out to be an actual species. Um, well, I'm, I'm quite confident that it's a, it's Imperator. You are? Because they did do the DNA, you know, studies on it. Um, Dr. Bobak and a few other guys in 2006 did um, some DNA sequencing and comparing the the Longicardus to other other Imperators. And they're, I guess, genotypically, they're mm -hmm. the same as Imperator, but phenotypically, they're different. Yeah. Um, but the long tail, to me, 
gives me something else. And, and you know, if you look at the range where they come from, <clears throat> they are genetically isolated yeah. from everything around them. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like on one side, on their on their west side, there's there's the Pacific Ocean. On their east side is a small mountain range, which is the remnants of the Andes Mountains. To their south is a desert, and to mm -hmm. their north are are smaller mountains also. So they're kind of isolated in a pocket. Um, I think more more DNA studies should be done on them to you know to see what they find. Yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, I'm I'm reviewing a paper at the moment that's um, identifying a new species of boa. Um, and I'll, uh, I can talk to you about that off camera later on. Right. Um, but, but I've, you know, I've always wondered about longer cotter because, you know, I don't see a lot of people crossing them into Imperator. I did just see, I just did see that this year, however, in Europe, somebody had bred and I, I, but I was always curious, you know, given the hemi penal difference, you know, that, right. that, that could be a massive barrier, right? Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it appears it's been done. You know, I'm curious what way it was done. I'm, so in that case, you probed the males and they were up to 40 scales deep. What about the females? Were they just the same as uh, as Imperator, you know, the three to five or three to seven? Or did they show a, an increased depth of that hemipenal uh, kind of sack, that pocket? They were they were the same as in, Imperator. They were like eight, eight to okay. Seven to ten, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah. But then again, that has nothing to do with reproduction. That that little anal gland. Yeah, you know? right, so, right. Um, but you're right. I think the guy who just did the breeding used a longicauda female with an imperator male. I think if you did it the other way around, a longicauda male <laughs> to an imperator female, I, I don't know if it'll work. Yeah, you know? that's it. That's what I thought for a while. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And that was something we talked about when we described the species too. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's in the paper. It it basically says, due to the size of the hemipenes on these snakes, you know, the authors think that the chances of these animals crossbreeding with other imperators is is not likely. So, but then again, we didn't. You know, back then we it would have had to been done. You know, we didn't know. So from that original group, where the, you know the anarchistics popped out of that, but were, were were did they come out of a breeding or did the or were there some of the original animals anarthristic? I'm pretty sure one of the originals was anarthristic because Joel Rosen had gotten some from us and he produced the first anarthristics. And the only reason why he could tell is because when they're babies, the normal babies have like this <clears throat> yellowish brownish look to their saddles and their tails. And the anary ones look like, you know, black and white photographs. Yeah, yeah. So I know the first ones that were born were from this guy, Joel Rosen. Mm -hmm. um, and then that line just, you know, just, I know Don Hamper got some way back when, um, you know, again, this stuff gets scattered into wind, into the wind, literally, who knows where it ends up. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah. A cool species and one that I regret every day selling my, I had a really nice pair and I sold them, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago before I moved to, to Oklahoma. Stupidly, I sold those in a beautiful pair of Captain Bread Guianans. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I look back and I think, and, I, and every year I'm like, I'm going to get them again. I'm definitely going to get them again. And then by the end of the year, I haven't. So maybe maybe this is the year to do it. Once I move, that will give me an excuse to get some. You yeah, cool. yeah, really cool. Do, do you find them any way different to keep than, than you know, your other boys? I, I get asked a lot. You know, Warren, what way do you keep your Sonoran boas? What way do you keep? And I'm like, I keep all of my boas exactly the same. So right? do I. The, the Sonorans I might keep a little cooler. Right, I do that. I, I let them in, drop cooler. I put them in the bottom racks. So they're just in a, yeah. like a cooler place in the building. That's about it. Same with That's, the, yeah. you know, the Longicauter, maybe a little cooler. Yeah. Um, but a little cooler is just a few degrees. It's nothing extreme. So do you let them get cooler in the winter? Because like with my... With my Sonorans, I have the best success breeding them whenever they those females can get to a cool spot of around 72, 70 to 72 degrees. And they'll go and sit on that spot for two months. You know, they've still got access to a hot spot, but they, they rarely use it. They just sit in the cool end. Um, whereas my the Costa Ricans and, and Nicaraguans tend not to go that cold. They'll stay a little bit warmer. 
Yeah. yeah, it's the same thing that you know if if I get if my building gets down to seventy two to seventy four, that's all I need. You yeah. know, and the snakes that are closer to the floor are closer to the seventy two mark. The snakes that are up higher are closer to the seventy four mark. Right. And you know, like Sigma, the uh, uh, the Mexican stuff, they they're nowhere near the heat. They like like you said, I do the same thing. They have heat. They can yeah. get to a small hot spot. But they're nowhere near it in the winter. They're they're just away from it. So yeah, right. I don't treat. I treat. I do the same thing. I treat all my boas. All my boas are in one warehouse in yeah. one temperature range. Yeah, they have you know a, a summer of eighty six degrees is the is the hottest, and they have a winter of seventy two is the coldest, and mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. It's not rocket science. That's what I tell people. You know, they're, they're trying it to program it to be this and that. And I'm like, you know, it's not rocket science to keep a boa healthy. And it's, it's not necessarily that hard to breed most of them, um, you know, just with the right food cycling and so on, temperature cycling. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people forget about humidity. I mean, the, the boas like humidity. I, I, I've been to, to Ecuador and Peru and Costa Rica and Nicaragua and it's, it's really humid there, even in the dry season. You know? yeah. I, I remember coming home from Ecuador and it was their dry season. Yeah. I came home from Ecuador. I opened my luggage and it was soaking wet. It didn't yeah. feel soaking wet when I was there. No. I've, said that, I've said that to lots of people, you know, because I, I, in my former position, I used to teach a course in Costa Rica. Uh, and uh, we used to go there every Thanksgiving for 10 days. And, uh, it was just at the tail end of the wet season. But, you know, I had to tell the students to remember that it was the wet season. And while they call it the dry season, it's really just the wet season and the slightly less wet season. Exactly. You know, and you get there, you get off the bus, and instantly your clothes just soak up all of that humidity. Your yep. passport inflates to four times the size. Don't bring a book. <laughs> it's not look the same again. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something that, that that people don't consider. I I agree with you. So in that case, do you um, do you provide additional humidity in your in your building, or do you just or do you miss the 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 cages, or do you just put big water bowls in over the heat, or what way do you raise the humidity? No, I'm lucky. In the summer, my building is very humid because it's very humid here on Long Island, New York. It's never really dry. It's dry in the winter because we've got heat right. heating the building. So it, it automatically creates a drier season. Mm -hmm. um, but the summer, if it's, you know, if it's 90% humidity outside, it's 90% humidity in my warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they get the humidity. And if they are dry, I, I have hoses that I walk around with, with, you know, with a nozzle on them and yeah. I spray the boas. Yeah. In the winter, I spray them almost daily just so that they have some humidity. Right. I don't want them to dry out completely. Their lungs dry out. They're in trouble. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, yeah. the, the, I was in Ecuador in January, which was their the height of their dry season. The river was low. All of the huts we were in were on stilts. There, were, there was no water under them. It was like dry riverbed. But yet it still rained almost every day. Yeah. You know, and that's the dry season. Yeah. So. Think about it. The wet season, it's raining cats and dogs all day, every day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In Costa Rica, I've, I've been there where it's rained, you know, for four days continually. And you right. see the river increasing dramatically every day. You know, the river that's 60 feet below the bridge. Right. You, know, you go back a day later and it's 40 feet below the bridge. And you go back a day later, it's 20 feet. You know, yeah. it's a, an incredible amount of rain that falls in those areas. I, um, I think most people keep their their reptiles way too hot and way too dry <laughs> yeah. and i think the problem with that also is that for those for many of them that keep them humid they don't provide airflow right they, they airflow, stagnate them and they get mold yeah. exactly you know you're going to get an ri infection just as fast with 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 it being dry or with it being too wet and no airflow and i and i talk to people about that continually with tree boas and with ground boas, you know, that you need to make sure you've got airflow. Right. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, that can kill them just as fast. Well, you know, Keith was mentioned earlier that I'm a bonsai artist, and I learned under the tutelage of a, a master, a Japanese master. 
And one of the things he told me 30 years ago, my original master, he said, it's going to take you 20 years to learn how to water your bonsai. And I laughed at him. I'm like, you're just watering them. What do you mean? And he was right because it did take me 20 years to figure out how to water them properly. Mm -hmm. And I tell my apprentice, I'm like, it's going to take you 20 years to learn how to get the humidity right in your snakes. Yeah. He's like, what are you kidding me? I just missed them now. I'm like, no, you can do give them too much. <laughs> you right. can make them get mold. You could, you can really screw them up, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it takes experience and it takes trial and error. You, cause everybody's, everybody's facility is different you yeah. know like i love airflow i have giant exhaust fans pulling in air from outside all summer mm -hmm. um if it's 85 outside it's 85 in my warehouse if it's 90 outside i'll i'll put an air conditioner to bring it down to 87 because mm -hmm. i don't like it getting past 87 in there right. right but 85 86 that's fine with me and above that i'm done so rarely do I put that air conditioner on. If I do, it's in the middle of the day when it's real hot and then it's off. It's not on all night, you know? Yeah. I remember, I remember maybe 16 years ago. Um, I think I'd been in the U S maybe a year, maybe 17 years ago. Um, a couple of friends of mine were friends with Pete Cal and, uh, they invited me up to see his collection or his facility. And that's whenever he had, he had the two warehouses side by side, you know, one with ball pythons and then one, the other one with all with boas. And I remember walking in and he had these massive funnels. I don't know if you're ever there. Just yeah, I I humidity, that. you know, ultrasonic, just mad. They, they looked like the freaking funnels on the Titanic. They were huge, right, right. you know, to raise the humidity in his, in his building. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty important. It, it really is. It really is. And it's something that, again, it takes a long time to learn. Um, it's not something that you can just read a book about, you know, mm -hmm. everybody's facility is different. Everybody's climate is different. You know, I mean, you think about people who are living, you, where'd you say you were in Arizona? Or? I was in, I, I live currently in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but we're oh. moving to Blacksburg, Virginia. So that's, you know, I'm looking at my window and I, you know, there's, I'm in the Shenandoah Valley, you know, so it's going to be totally different from where I, yep. where I was. Oklahoma and, is very dry. Yeah, very dry, you know, and before yeah. that, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina. So my animals have moved around, you know, that, that was 11 years ago. But, you know, once you get into a room and you get into that kind of rhythm of it and things start doing what they should be doing, and then I'm going to be screwing them all up and taking them to a different place. <laughs> yeah, you know? they need a year or two to adjust. Yeah. But if you're yeah. good and you can duplicate the conditions in your in your home, in your house and wherever you're going to keep them, then you'll be fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too worried. And, you know, having a year or two not breeding doesn't scare me. It's actually it's right. kind of like nice, you know. <laughs> right. But uh, I'm just looking forward to getting them all set up again. And, uh, you know, Scott Boback is just down the road from me. He's just a couple of hours away. So um, we're doing some work together. So it'll be fun to go down and see Scott as well. So He's a great guy. He really knows his stuff. He's one of those, he's one of those PhD professors like yourself that, really knows what he's doing because i ran into phd professors that don't know what's going on as far as you know reptiles and stuff mm -hmm. um, but that guy he knows his stuff he well he's you know you know that's i was going to bring that up you know you know the, if you could talk about your relationship and your interactions with scott because scott brought in the original you know some of the crawl k's and the west snake k's and so on the lagoon k snakes right so well, back in 2008, Scott had uh, contacted me because um, we had a mutual friend, Louis Poros. Mm -hmm. Louis, Louis Poros and, um, and Bob Sears would take the private plane and go to those islands. Yeah. And then Louis wrote a, an article about it in Reptiles Magazine, I think in like 2001 or two, I forget the date. Mm -hmm. And... Um, probably before 2001, because I know Scott was getting his PhD dissertation in 2002. And I think what happened, well, no, I know what happened. Scott told me he read that, that article by Louis and it, a little light bulb went off in his head and he's like, I can get my PhD dissertation on Island snakes, you know, Island locality boas, dwarf boas. And um, he contacted Louis and Louis gave him the, 
the you know the map of where he went, so to speak. And Scott, you know, with with permits in hand, went to Belize and well, went to Belize, got permits to collect snakes, and went to the exact locations where Louis went. And he had gotten, uh, I think, six or seven crawl K boas, a, a bunch of stuff, like you said, um, West Snake K, Mainland Belize, Lagoon K. Um, brought them back and was doing his his study on them, and it turned out he had all um, female crawl Ks. <laughs> so he said to Louis, "Where can I find a male?" And Louis's like, "Well, you could um, contact Vin. He has snakes from." the Bob Sear stuff that are direct descendants of the snakes that we got. Mm-hmm. So that's how I met Scott. He, he contacted me and said, I need a male. I said, well, I'll just give you one. Why don't you give me a female? So this way I'll have another bloodline because mine are babies of babies. You know, they're F twos yeah. from, you know, captain born boas that came from Bob. Um, he's like, all right, no problem. So he, he drove from, uh, Pennsylvania to, to Long Island and we spent the day together mm-hmm. in my facility and went out and had, you know, dinner. We did a bunch of things and, um, I gave him, I gave him one of mine and he gave me one of his and I eventually bred that snake and made some, you know, for me outcrossed crawl cabo is, um, and then we did some other studies together, um, not studies. I would just send him like a whole litter of crawl cabo is, and he would have one of his students do like a feeding uh, study on them. Like take, mm-hmm. you know, four or five of them and feed them every three weeks, take four or five of them and feed them every two months, you know, mm-hmm. weigh them constantly to make sure they're not losing weight as to be, you know, um, you know, deleterious to their to their health but you know stay on top of them and watch them and then and at the end of the the study he would send me a bunch of stuff back like oh i got too many of these you know take them back yeah so um we worked together for many years that way and he's become a really good friend you know i wish i could see him more he's he's not that close to me um but i'm thinking about um moving out that way (laughs) oh you are yeah, I like I like Pennsylvania. I like um Yeah, he's in like he's in that, Muslim, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I like that area. Yeah. So no. but maybe one day, who knows? It's a lot of animals to move. You know, that's why I'm thinking about going, you know, because for me that's a three hour drive, three or four hour drive. I can do that. I'm not going to Florida, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm not loading up, you know, a uh a Penske rental truck, a, you know, a 40 foot rental truck with, with yeah. reptiles and doing two or three trips to Florida. No way. Yeah. I'll do two or three trips to, to Pennsylvania. Yeah. But that's easy. You can do that in the morning and come back in the evening. I can you do know. it. In, I can do a week, a weekend. I can do the whole thing probably. So, yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, I will say living in the mountains, it is beautiful. You know, that's it's- where I want to go. I love the mountains of, uh, of New York. Yeah. Um, but it's just uh, it's just a little too cold. The mountains of New York, it's way, way cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, no it's like zone four or five, which is way below zero Fahrenheit. You know, that's too cold for me. So, you know, you, you mentioned Sears. Um, is that how you got into the Hog Island boas as well? Well, yeah, the 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 hogs that I had gotten came from Bob Sears, mm-hmm. but I also had gotten some hogs from Cameron uh, Bushmaster back in the, I guess, early nineties. They were still way early nineties. Yeah. I had gotten some from him back then. So I had those and, and luckily, not luckily, but I, I documented it in my book in 2004, Crutchfield got a bunch of them in. Mm-hmm. And the documentation I did in my book was information I got from the, from the, there was a foundation doing research on, um, that Dr. Boback told me about on, on Hog Island. And they had caught a guy who had a boat with pillow cases with snakes in it. Mm-hmm. And it turned out that they caught him, but he must have done it at least one time before because those snakes left Honduras and went to Florida and Crutchfield ended up with them. 
and myself and Gus Renfro bought all of them from him. I think he just had like four or five of them. It was a bag full of Hog Island bones. Mm -hmm. So I got those. I got the original Sears stuff and um, some of the original stuff from Cameron. And um, I have them to this day. I, I, I love those snakes because to me, they're the only real ones in the country. I, I, I don't care what anybody says. If they didn't come from those three lines, mm -hmm. you don't have hogs because I see so many imposters. It's insane, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is the, um, I uh, interacted with a, a guy that was doing his PhD on boas of Honduras from the UK. Uh, maybe uh, this is about 18 years ago, maybe 17 or 18 years ago. I actually, the, the, the first time that I developed molecular markers for boas, there were for this kid's um, PhD work. Um, and he had sent me pictures of of other boas from the other islands in the Bay Islands. Mm -hmm. Hogs are the only ones that look like hogs. You know, you go right. to some other islands, and they, they look more like mainland. Um, exactly. Night and day different, you know? So, um, yeah, like those snakes from Rutan. Mm -hmm. They look like mainland Honduran boas. They got a lot of orange in them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, you know, think about it. Hog Island is a volcanic uplift island with with very deep water around it. Mm -hmm. So the chances of things rafting to and from that island, which is like, what, 10 miles off the coast? Mm -hmm. From what yes. I understand, the currents there are, are not conducive of things rafting back and forth. So it's the same thing, the same scenario with those dwarf or ticks, the, the Jampianus. The, they, they come from a similar environment. They, the oceans there are deep and the currents run swift and the, the chances of things traveling constantly around them to and from them are not very good so that's why those snakes are genetically isolated isolated and look different same with the hogs i mean you're right they, there's nothing around that even closely resembles them yeah. speckled and light colored i mean you don't see it no no they're, they're they're beautiful and uh you know the variation in them i think is fantastic but i think the big thing for them for many people is just that color changing ability yeah. at night you know like i i saw um, a friend of mine um, back in the UK, a guy called Clive Osborne, he passed away a number of years ago, but he had, he was a connoisseur of, of boas and he had some F1s uh, from Hog Islands. And at night you'd go into his room and they, they were the first ones that I saw that, that literally turned milk white and pink. Right. They're just incredible, you know, and, and I've got a small group of Hog Islands, but um you know, when I was when I was at my friend's house a week ago and checking in on them, it was in the evening and I saw them doing the same thing. Just that it brought me right back to that time I saw those those right. F ones. The color is just fantastic on them. You know, just Keith, do you have Hog Islands as well? Yeah, I got them from Vin actually out in Tinley and uh, bred them <laughs> once already since I've gotten yeah. them from them. And uh, I love the size. You know, the, my adult sort of maybe three feet long. They're, they're, yeah small boas you know three three and a half feet tops yeah, they're awesome yeah. i love them yeah that's definitely another way of knowing that they're real because they're not big i mean no i mean on on the island dr bovac was telling me that they get to a certain size and then they kind of stop but if they can eat those tinosaurs then they get may get a little bigger you know mm -hmm. yeah. and prior to the pet industry collecting all the boas back in the 80s there was supposedly a lot of those little um i forget what they call them uh, goodies yeah the little small deer type looking. Look like a little deer guinea pig yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh supposedly once the boas were extirpated so to speak those little those little uh, goodies took over the island <laughs> wow. there's nothing to eat them mm -hmm. so um they may have if they got to the point where they could have eaten those, then they may have grown a little bit more. But they definitely are a uh, an island race, small island race snake, three, four yeah. feet, and that's about it. Yeah. So talking to talking to Chad Montgomery, who did work there, um, he had said that rarely they would find like a six foot animal, but he said it was it was broomstick thin because there was nothing for them to eat routinely. Right. Um, so they were just, you know, as we know, snakes continue to grow throughout their life. Um, but, you know, these are ones that just kind of hung on, but they were, you know, 
once they get past that four and a half feet, four feet, then they're, they're not reproducing. You know, they, right. can't, they can't right. get enough sustenance to do so. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you know and it's, it, you know, it's, it's just the same with these, the dwarf kind of island boas, the crawl caves and the, the lagoon caves and so on, because they just don't have prey that's big enough to take them past that three and a half feet, four right. feet range, right? Well, you know, Dr. Bobak did a, a whole study on that. Even the, the jaws, mm-hmm. um, the shape and the musculature of their head is different from the mainland snakes because they don't use the, the, the muscles to swallow big prey. Yeah. You know? Fascinating. Very, very cool. Yeah, I love it. I mean, this, this stuff for me is, this is what got me into locality boas. You know, mm-hmm. the, the geography of them where they come from the, I mean, think about those crawl K boas. They eat literally twice a year. Yeah. And they go one meal twice a year. They eat when the migratory birds drop off on those islands to get a drink of water from a cup of water in in a leaf. Um, And they sit and gorge themselves for what? A few weeks. Yeah. And they do that twice a year and they're done. And the babies are eating, you know, Dr. Bobak was telling me they have a, a crawl K boa spit up a crab. Good Think God. about that. A boa that ate a crab. <laughs> They're eating anything. Yeah. Anything they can get. So it, it, it's funny because people are like, oh, then they're going to be difficult to feed. I'm like, no. <laughs> They'll eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> wow. If they eat mice, no problem. <laughs> and then, you know, so you find that they're small. Are the litter sizes small or are the babies small? You know, like you look at Sonoran boas and they are not big snakes, but they have big litters. Right, but the babies. Yeah, it's it, it's different. The babies aren't aren't really really small, mm. and the females like today. I had a litter of um, they weren't K boas, but it was um Nicaragua boa. They had six six mm-hmm. babies, mm-hmm. and two little slugs, and that's it. It was a small female. I mean, maybe maybe four feet, maybe. Yeah. Um, and the crawl the the K boas are the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, the hogs too. If I get ten, that's a lot. I'm like, wow, ten. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And the Tarahumara too. And even though they're not an island, they're they are um, genetically isolated in these canyons where they could they're sky islands. I mean, they well, could exactly. Be, that's it. They are they are essentially yeah. islands. You know, people think about yeah. islands. When people think about islands, they think about a, a land body surrounded by water. But an yeah. island. You know, whenever we think about it, evolutionarily or ecologically, it's just an area that is isolated from another area. And that can be through a mountain range or it can be through a water body or it can be through just a change in habitat type. You exactly. Know? It could be dry at the bottom and cloud forest at the top and they live in the cloud forest. They're not leaving the cloud forest. Why would they go into the dry environment when they've got the perfect cloud forest to eat and live in the perfect humidity you know so like those tamalipas cloud forests mm-hmm. they're in a cloud mm-hmm. forest the snakes all the snakes around them are very different yeah even mm-hmm. um even the lepidus which are the, the little rattlesnakes the lepidus and tamalipas are way different from the lepidus around them in different ranges yeah so they're genetically isolated in these little places and they just look different you know yeah. they, they yeah, are I- phenotypically different Isolated for a long time, as the other right thousands of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Tamalipas, they're 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 a lot. I've never had, I've never kept those. They're ones that I they're on my list, um, and and they're tiny, right? They are they're a small race as well. They're small, but I wouldn't say they're tiny. I mean, you they they could get five feet. Oh, okay. but they are they are a small snake because they breed small. That's how I judge it. If they will breed at a small size, then I know their adult, their mature adult size is small. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. the Tamalipas will breed small. They'll breed like three or four feet and they'll have like six to, to eight babies. Mm-hmm. But when they're bigger, they're like the Sonora boas. They'll have okay. 20, 25, you know? Yeah, yeah I was, I was bigger, you know, the Sonoras, I've been breeding Sonora boas for, I don't know, like nearly, nearly 30 years. And uh, the first litter that I got, I was amazed at the number of babies in it for the size yeah. of the female. Yeah. You know, just a massive number. But then you look at a, a baby Sonoran and you look at a baby Nicaraguan side by side, and the mothers could be the same size, but these babies are night and day different. 
Right. You know, they're incredible. You know, the, um, the other, this was another question I get a lot. It's how did, how did the, uh, the Tamil Ebus, how did the Tarahumara come into the, into the hobby? You could probably speak about that. Well, I talk about it in my book. The Tarahumaras were, were, um, snakes that a few guys from uh, a university down in Texas were doing research on. I think it was Texas a and I'd have to look back. Mm-hmm. And um, they were doing some kind of um, ecological study in, on the, the Tarahumara um, mountains and the, and the fauna and flora. And they brought back some snakes. And they did their study, and they they didn't know what to do with them afterwards. So they gave them to Gus Renfro, hmm. and he had bred them. And the entire race started, I think, I think two males and a female, something like that. So um, that's how they got here. And same with the Tamalipas cloud forest. There's a group of guys that would take um, take college people to Tamalipas for. Uh, that's how I know about the lepidus. They were doing research on the lepidus and some other lizards there and a couple guys found one guy found a boa one year brought it back um gave it to gus and like a year or two later found another boa gave gave it to gus you know a year or two after that and it turned out he had a pair from that point so Hmm. and that whole line started with a single pair too so it's researchers such as yourself that went into the field and were bringing stuff back and didn't know what they would do with them. The same with Bobak, you know, Dr. Bobak would give me stuff to to do things with either breeding or feeding or, or whatever. So mm-hmm. it's great to be in touch with people like that because that's the that's the best way to get them into the country legally, you know. Yeah. And even then it's not easy. You know? No, it's, it's not. still it's no. still a lot of work to get scientific permits to bring them in and the restrictions that can go along along with right. that. So because we've been we've been looking into uh, trying to get nebulosa and uh, yeah well that's a different thing because that's that snake could be its own species yeah I, I believe it is yeah yeah me too uh, uh, that and Arophius, i believe or right you know and um, they were when they were originally described as boa Arophius and boa, boa nebulosa so yeah yeah it wasn't until later on i think luther four car changed everything to boa constrictor which was wrong also so mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I have issue from Nebulosa and from Arophius here that at some point I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sequence. Um, but I'm, I, I, I would be shocked if they're not their own thing. I would be too, because think about it. They are in the middle of friggin' nowhere. Yeah. I mean, the closest, the closest snake to them is what Guyana or. Yeah. And it's a long way away. Yeah. Or, or, um, What's the other one? It's not Guyana. It's um, Venezuela. Venezuela, Trin- yeah, Venezuela. I mean, Trin- Trin- yeah, Trin- or Trinidad. Trinidad you know? Tobago would be the closest. Yeah, yeah, Trinidad is about it. That's yeah. far. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Nothing we- swimming from Trinidad to to uh, you know to Dominica. The what do they call them? The Seychelles? Not the Seychelles. The yeah. Why am I drawing a blank? Antilles? The, 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 Antilles, the, Antilles, yeah. yeah. Nothing swimming from Trinidad to the Antilles. The way to go. <laughs> but they're beautiful. Have you ever kept Nebulosa? I had one Arophius. Yeah, I remember you telling me about years that ago. before. Yeah. And I couldn't find a mate to it. I had it for I had it probably 15 years, mm-hmm. and it just died of old age. I never could find another one. Yeah, that's heartbreaking. I've I, seen nebulosis though. I've I've held them when I was in uh, when I was in uh, Houghton, mm-hmm. Holland at uh, Snake Day with my friend Frank. Mm-hmm. There was a kid walking around with with two of them, and I, I was like, I got to touch that. Yeah. <laughs> I that's just awesome. hold it, yeah, you know, just to see it. How long ago was that? That was um, probably uh, two thousand and. Early mid 2000, 2007, maybe. Yeah, because I remember on Facebook or one of those kind of social media, there was a somebody that was breeding Arophius and I think Nebulosa as well. And then they disappeared. And I heard, 
I heard that they got their animals came down with IBD or something like that there. And I why, heard the same why, thing. Yeah. That's heartbreaking. Yeah, I heard the same thing. I uh my friend Clive, he had a pair of Orophius and a pair of Nebulosa. So, you know, twenty five years ago I was living at those in England. And, right. and at that point I it didn't I didn't realize how significant that was. Right. But I do remember every time he wanted like every time he would take the Orophia side, he was the first guy to put on the rubber gloves. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were absolutely incredible. And whenever he died, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what happened to those, but he also had nebulosa and these were long, dark, nasty boas. Mm -hmm. Terrible. And I kept looking at them thinking, why would anybody want those? And now, of course, <laughs> it's like, I get my right testicle for those. Like, I get both. <laughs> Right, so <laughs> just a, an incredible animal. Did your Orophius did it, did it behave any differently? Um, it was a little different. Yeah, it, it wouldn't seek heat for some reason. Mm -hmm. I just kept it warm because it would stay away from the heat. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this thing's gonna kill itself. You know? <laughs> but yeah, they're they're definitely weird snakes. I mean. And from what I gather, their their environment is different. They they also colonize like rattlesnakes, from what I heard, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nothing. We don't know enough about them yet. But yeah. I truly believe that they are their own species for yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. they look prehistoric. They look like they look like uh, something you'd find on Skull Island with King Kong. You know. Yeah, and they're restricted to a single island each. Yeah. Right anything happens to that they're gone like that really yeah, is well, those are, they're pretty big islands so yeah. it's not like it's, it's not like crawl k can be that it can be different. washed away yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah that 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 is another fascinating question thinking about you know with any hurricanes that, that go through those areas they could totally you know that that lineage could be extinct right with one hurricane right. wiping through it yeah well, you know, Dr. Bobak was concerned that, you know, he only found females on that island. He was like, where are all the males? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Maybe mm -hmm. there weren't any. Who knows? I wonder, where, yeah, or, or were they occupying a different kind of niche on the island? Right. But, or maybe they were so small that they were just hiding and hunkering, hunkering yeah. down. You just couldn't find them. Yeah. You know, you were just finding the most obvious snakes that were feeding follicles, you know. Right. Looking for looking right. for birds and they were just out in the open. The males were mm -hmm. were fine. So with with to go back to the islands then, um, with your animals, are you finding that they take uh, are they kind of breeding every two to three years or do yours breed will they breed annually or how how are yours? You know, I I found that they will breed easily annually. Hmm. With maybe maybe six to ten meals between babies. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So they, wow. You don't even need to do much. I think most people feed them way too much. Yeah. You know, I agree with you. Um, I have, I have one K Cocker that's given me eight litters in her life. And it was eight in a row. There was no breaks. Mm -hmm. And she had either the same number or one more every year. Wow. Never that's, less. That's mm -hmm. interesting. The most efficient breeding snake I ever had was a K Cocker. Eight litters. Yeah, I've always said uh, my snakes grow more whenever they're not fed. You know? Yeah, that was something I learned from Eugene Bissett. Snakes yeah. grow when you don't feed them. Yeah, that's it. You know, they, they continue it's to thrive. And uh, they're storing energy. Yeah, know? they utilize it better. Whenever you feed them fewer yeah. times, they, they utilize the food that, that, they, that they are getting, you know? Yeah, these snakes evolved. I mean, they're prehistoric creatures. They've evolved in a feast or famine environment. Yeah. So when you do feed them, if you feed them too much, it's just going to be wasted. Yeah. But if you feed them properly, they'll use every bit of it. Mm -hmm. But you know what? You know what's great? Most people, it's not great, it's sad. Most people, have like I call it the Italian grandmother syndrome. Yeah, they have to feed things. Yeah, they have to watch the meat. If they don't eat, they get very upset. Yeah, you know? yeah. 
meanwhile, my my K boa males they may eat they may eat five or six meals a whole year. I know. You know? Yeah, that's it. No, I love it. You know, like I, I think we've we've talked about this before, but I don't feed mine yeah. from November through the kind of end of February, and it's the best thing ever. There's no there's nothing to clean up. Right. You give them water. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And yet they still grow and they look great. You know? Yeah, they're fine. They're yeah. fine. Yeah. So, Keith, have you got any questions? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. While we're talking about feeding, I'd like to get uh, Vin's input on red tails. And, you know, it used to be uh, young red tails, you could get, uh, if you were power feeding them, that regurgitation with uh, the con boa constrictors, you know, more than imperator. Um, do you think that's because strictly that people are overfeeding them or feeding them too large meals or what's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, constrictor hatchlings, babies in the, in the wild aren't eating mice. You know, they're not eating mice and rats. They're probably eating geckos and frogs um, and they're probably eating very sparingly, you know. So, and again, they're in very high humidity too. I noticed that constrictor will puke up those hairballs when they're too dry. Mm. And if you feed them too much. Interesting. So you feed them very sparingly. You know, I feed them all of my constrictor. I feed them maybe a small hopper every like two weeks or three weeks. I grow them really slow. I mean, really slow. They, they don't even get close to eating a rat till they're like four years old, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I think that's the trick. I think people keep them too dry and I think they feed them too many mice. So, um, yeah, on the smaller, smaller meals. Yeah, on the dryness, I've noticed that with Corallus, uh, Especially same the thing. emeralds. Yeah, same thing, yeah. you know. If you don't keep that humidity up and all, you can start a regurgitation problem there with them if they don't keep them hydrated. Yeah, they're literally dehydrated. You right, know? right. And it's the same thing with prolapses right. on, you know, corallus or even green, um, trees. green tree pythons. But I know people keep them way too dry. I, I, see, I see all these other podcasts. Where these people think they know what they're doing and they're like, oh, well, you got to let them dry out in between being wet. I'm like, no, you don't. They live in 95% humidity all year round. Yeah. Why would you dry them out ever? Just make sure they're you not know, babies. That's it. So yeah. I keep all of that stuff. The constrictor, the all the corallus and all of the, the chondropythons, I still call them chondropythons, are 90, 95% 90, humidity all the time. In the winter, it may get down a little bit less, but I still, you know, try to keep them hydrated. Because once they're, once they're dehydrated, they're done. You know, their lungs dry out a couple of times, they're done. There's also, yeah. also kidney function. Whenever they dehydrate the yeah, kidneys, kidneys right. Yeah. And yeah. then once, once that's done, then they're, they're gone. Yeah. That's why with, uh, with all of my Corallis, even, you know, whenever I would get wild caught emeralds and that's very rare, but I would only do it if I was trying to get like anaconda phase or patternless, Right. And, you know, everyone's going on about treating them for parasites and this and that. I don't, I put them into a tub with an arboreal water bowl and high humidity and airflow. And I leave them alone. I don't even look at them for weeks on end. Right. Make sure they've got fresh water and, and, and I've got emeralds here and even my Trinidad tree boas, um, you know, all being wild caught, they've never been wormed, you know, yeah. and they're, they're thriving, absolutely thriving, you know. Well, you know, if they have any parasites, the parasites will take over one when they are stressed out from being dehydrated or too hot mm -hmm. or being fed too much, too big of a meal. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's like, a, it's an evil cycle. And yeah. people, again, most keepers most keepers have Italian grandmother syndrome, even with their tree pythons and tree boas, and they feed them way too much. So this, trying you know, to eat them. I heard you mentioning um, the idea that, you know, these smaller boas are probably, they're not eating rodents. You know, I think that's pretty clear. If you go to these areas, it's not as if mice are running around your feet, you know? No. So what you see a lot of 
are frogs and lizards. Um, and therefore, you know, my belief also is the Central American boas are just the same. They're eating whatever they can get, but they'll tend to be lizards and, right. and frogs and so on. Um, with that in mind, there's in the last couple of years, there's, I've seen a lot of people posting or talking about kind of offering a diverse diet for their snakes and the benefits of it. Um, is that something you do? Like, I don't. I feed rats and mice, and that's it. And I've never seen a problem with them. I got some old ass snakes, you know. So. There's no benefit. If anything, it's it's counterproductive because if you're going to feed them lizards, you're beginning you're bringing in amoebas and bacteria and mm -hmm. and um, viruses. You're bringing in diseases, mm -hmm. parasites. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's counterproductive. They, they do fine on rodents. There's no reason why we need to give them anything differently. Like I was saying to keep before, with constrictor, the babies, I just feed them a lot less. Yeah. They take forever to grow, but that's the way it's supposed to be. They don't yeah. grow fast in the wild. You know what grows fast in the wild? Pythons. Mm -hmm. Because they live in environments, all, most pythons live in environments where if they don't grow fast, they get big enough to eat bigger things, they're done. Yeah. Well, pythons grow fast. You know, ball pythons grow fast in the wild. So there's been plenty of research done on that. Burmese pythons, shit. When I was breeding Burmese pythons in a year, you can get them up to 10 feet. Easy. Yeah. And you're not doing anything to hurt them in any way because they're just growing. Retics too. Retics. Jesus. A mainland retic, a Sulawesi retic when I was a kid. I got one up to like 12 feet in a year. Wow. Just by feeding it, feeding it, feeding it. Mm -hmm. But that was the mentality everybody had. And then I they think, tried doing it with boas, and mm -hmm. they killed them. Yeah, yeah. That that you know, thinking back to thirty years ago, whenever I started, it really was feed them. Make sure you feed them. You know, I had I worked in a reptile store, and people would come in every Saturday morning to buy their rats to feed their snakes every Saturday. You know, and yep. that works for some things. Colubrids, most colubrids need that there because of their higher right. metabolism. Uh, but boas do not do well on that at all. They just get obese. <laughs> Frank, uh, Frank Greedis coined, uh, you got to feed them to breed them, right? And uh, everybody yeah. applied that to every reptile every in captivity. <laughs> well, you know, think about colubrids, and especially North American colubrids, like hognose snakes or even king snakes. Mm -hmm. They live in an environment where they have literally this little window yeah. of food opportunity, mm -hmm. and they gorge themselves for that little window. Mm -hmm. Just have enough energy to build eggs to lay eggs and reproduce mm -hmm. then they are done till the next spring you oh, know yeah. but since they have that feeding um intuition people think oh they're hungry all the time so they just feed them feed them feed them feed them feed them you know right. but colubrids like i breed pine snakes and the biggest mistake i see people making with them is they just keep feeding them mm -hmm. <laughs> they only need that that food for their egg, laying eggs. Yeah. And once they lay eggs, I barely feed them throughout the summer. <laughs> I mean, I feed them like a few meals here and there just mm -hmm. to give them their weight back. I mean, cause that's all they're doing where they come from. They're not finding stuff every Friday at six o'clock, no. you know? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> so then what are you excited about breeding this year? And don't say everything. Um, <laughs> you know, I've got a few things I'm working on, but I hate talking about them because when I do, <laughs> jinx it. <laughs> jinx it. <laughs> but yeah, I've got I've got some uh, some island stuff coming up this year. Um, you know, well we'll see. I mean, I, it, there's always something new every year. That's what's great about having my little facility where i just keep my own things i keep a closed facility i raise things up mm -hmm. every year something new is big enough to breed mm -hmm. you know like w w beginners beginners have this thing where they're in such a rush so they feed 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 and they want to get things big enough to breed because yeah. they want to see babies but i i i have stuff that's coming to to fruition every year mm -hmm. you know and there's a, a bunch of them you know because i always hold stuff back from almost every litter yeah. And so every year, like this year, I think will be a great Hog Island bow a year because I held back a bunch of them from 2016. So what are they, four, five, six? They're almost seven years old. And this will be some of them their first year. Some of them went last year. Mm -hmm. So six years, 
and they're small. I mean, they're like barely four feet, mm -hmm. but I think it'll be a great year for them. So hopefully I'll have a bunch of those because they're, they're popular. People oh, are yeah. out there. Oof. Anytime I've got Hog Islands, man, people are biting my arm off to get them. Yeah. But here's my biggest problem with the, with this. I get so many inquiries about them. Dear Vin, I want one Hog Island boa because I have one already mm -hmm. and I want to breed yours to mine. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, but here's the problem. You have a mutt. I know you do, whoever you are, you know, these people out in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're going to breed my real one to your mutt, and then you're going to say, I've got real hogs. Mm -hmm. So what I've been doing is I tell people you can only buy a pair. Mm -hmm. That's it. Because I don't want you mixing them into your mongrel, you know. And a lot of people get very upset with me about this. Like, I'm the asshole, you know. Mm -hmm. But yet, to me, it's like, it's like taking that purebred German Shepherd and breeding it to the mutt that looks like a German Shepherd and saying, look at my purebred showline German Shepherds when they're not even close, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's something that, that irks me that it's, it's hard to get across to people, you know? Mm -hmm. So your lifelong work, I mean, it's understandable. Right. It's, you know, it's something you've done your whole life and... Hog Islands are definitely a pet project of yours, you know, so it's totally understandable. And saying that, don't forget me for a pair because <laughs> because uh, one of the babies I sold to Chris uh, Allen Jensen, a friend of mine, he's looking for a pair to uh, to put with that animal. So right. yeah, keep me in mind for a pair. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, those are the types of projects that, like, they all go to my friends first. <laughs> Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like everybody I know who I know is going to do right by them gets them first. I don't, they don't go to strangers. Right. And that's why the shame is, was when the strangers inquire about them and say, Oh, I heard you have them. I'm like, no, there's none left. Mm -hmm. Well, but so-and-so said you have them. Well, they're gone. I don't know what to tell you. They only had eight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They didn't have 40. <laughs> I'm like they that with the East, eight, I'm know? like that with the Eastern Sanzinia. They, they, you know, they, they only go to, to people I know that would do right by right. them. And, I'm working with some other fellas and they get obviously their animals first, but if anything's left over, it would only go to somebody right. that's working for the right reasons. Yeah. Right. Like I did that for years with all my tree pythons. I never advertise them. I didn't have to. I just sell them to people I knew. I mean, and everybody was tripping over themselves to get them because they loved them. You know? Right. Right. So. So you, you, yeah. Yeah, you, you keep quite a diverse collection. I think most people associate you with boas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if they pay attention to your to your Instagram or whatever, you, you, you keep a really diverse collection from the colubrids through the blood pythons, through the corallus. Yeah, through the skinks, yeah. right? And Antaresia as well. I'm still the 15-year-old kid, yeah. you know, who's, like, into all these different things. Mm -hmm. So in order to keep it interesting for me, I, I will continue to do it that way because, uh, again, and I, I've said this before, uh, to me, they, they I think of them being in the banking world. I think of all of these different races of snakes as stocks. Yeah. You know, some some yeah. stocks are up, up and some are stocks are down, yeah. right? Yeah. Like right now. The locality bow is stocks are up. I don't care what anybody says. Mm -hmm. You know, people like locality bows because there's not a lot of people doing them. Mm -hmm. You can get all the morphs you want. You can get all the sharp albinos you want. <laughs> you know, right. you can get all that stuff fairly cheaply, which is great for beginners to get into. Who doesn't want a sharp sunglow? You know, mm -hmm. or or even you know a, a, a motley you know IMG, which is like a jet black snake. Yeah, all that stuff is awesome. I love it. I do IMGs too. Mm -hmm. But it's like the locality stuff is to me is a little more sophisticated. They, they take, they require a little more of a finesse for breeding and keeping. Um, they can't handle the Colombian feed them and breed them, no. you know, syndrome, which kind of works to my advantage in a way because mm -hmm. the people that do that aren't very fortunate in reproducing them. Mm -hmm. um, but I've written a book about how to take care of them and I don't know why nobody reads it. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, what, what people like to do are look at the pretty pictures. Right. Nobody so, really reads it. The best is I'll get emails about things. I, I got one yesterday asking me about, you know, the Sonora IMG. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I wrote about it in my book and it's a, it's a trait attached to the leopard gene. And, you know, Oh, I, I have your book. <laughs> Why didn't you read it? <laughs> I'll give you the page number. <laughs> Just read that page. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know, we're jumping around a little bit, but Sonora, like I, Sonora is my my favorite locality of Goa, and I've got a ton of them. I, I've been working with them for thirty years. Um, the anarthristics popped up in my group back in two thousand and two, um, and I just love them. But then I'm seeing. Over the last couple of years, we've seen with Mexican boas, the pied pop up. We've seen a number of albinos, T negative and T positive. And, and now there are a number of the T positives in the US I've seen. They've uh, made it across the border. Um, so I think, you know, that's a line that I think we're going to see explode in popularity. I feel yeah. over, over the coming years. Yeah, they're smaller than they're, they're a little more manageable. They have a lot of babies, which is nice. Mm hmm. Um, they're easy to breed. Mm -hmm. They can handle some neglect. You can handle being dried out. Right. You know. Um, yeah, I, I love the Sonora bows. And, and, you know, back in sometime in the mid 20 to 2012, 2014, something like that, um, a PhD from, um, a college here in Brooklyn came to me at White Plains and she said to me, uh, I forget her name off the top of my head. If I knew it, I would say it. Mm -hmm. She said she was doing uh, DNA sequencing and she wanted um, shed skins from lizards. That's what she said to me. She didn't even know who, what I was or what I was about. Mm -hmm. So I said to her, you know, why don't you do boas? Because there's, I have so many different types of boas. I can send you boas sheds and you can, uh, you know, look at them and do some DNA sequencing and see the differences. And, you know, she's like, oh, that's a great idea. I mean, it was just like a simple conversation. So um, I mailed her shed skins from uh, Tara Homara, um, Hypo Sonora. Mm -hmm. I tried to keep like one general, general area, um, Crawl K, mainland mm -hmm. Belize, Nicaragua, and I think Hog Island. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Central America, Mexico, I gave her. And she did her study and did like a poster on it in her school with her students. And um, she didn't publish the, 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 the findings. I don't know why. I told her she should. Mm -hmm. But when she did it, she came to, she's like, Vin, you're not going to believe this, but that, that Tara Hamara bow, it differs from the Crawl K bow by 5%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, are you serious? Yeah, I thought it was, I th and I thought it was the crawl K boa that was the five percent. But she's like, no, the crawl K is similar to the mainland snakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that 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 mountain boa that's very different. Yeah. So that that's when I realized these things are different. These Sonora boas. There's there's definitely something going on. And then in 2006, Bobak and a, and a, a bunch of other guys mm -hmm. did, did a. a their own study, Maristic study, and came up with the same same results. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I was part of a study um, a number of years ago where we, that's where we elevated it to Sigma, right? Uh, with Darren Card and that group, you know, and uh, right. there, it, it would be nice to to go back and to sequence, you know, across that range in a bit more detail. You know, the the Tara Hamara, the Tamalipas, because it wouldn't surprise me if other ones, you know, if they popped up as being uh, different themselves, even from the Mexican boas, because of the isolation that we've talked about. Right. You know, right? Yeah, I, I think the Tamalipas might be different too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and maybe even the Cancun because I have those too, and they're way different. Oh, you, they, you have Cancun. Right? They, mm -hmm. they act different. They they eat different. They breed different. In what way? What, what is the? What do you mean they eat different? What is their? What do you find different about them? They are very seasonal feeders. They do not eat all year round. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like most boas, you can feed them anytime you want. In the middle of the winter, if it's warm enough, they'll eat. Yeah. They'll, they'll try to eat. You, even if you just left a rat there, they'd eat it, come and eat it. Yeah. The Cancun boas, they eat in the, the heat, the hottest, most humid part of the, the year into the into the 
fall and they're done. You know, they eat for a few weeks and they're done. Mm -hmm. the, the males especially, they, they don't eat anything. And they breed like a tree boa. They wrap up, you know. They do the circular, yeah, right. Uh -huh. Yeah, they wrap completely around the female. I mean, multiple times. Corn islands do the same thing, right? Like, I've seen calls, I've seen corn islands and I've seen the Sabagay do it too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's an interesting, yeah. interesting variant. Yeah. Interesting. So are, are you breeding those, the Cancun? I'm not breeding them. They breed themselves. Well, <laughs> <laughs> are you hoping to produce some? Yeah. I'm hoping for babies from them because I've got a pair that are, um, I think eight years old and this is the first time the male even tried. Are they Eight are years. they lighter in color? Because I remember years ago, uh, maybe around 2000, 2002, um, there was a guy in England called Chris Gillum, and uh, and he had some Cancuns, or at least he was he was hosting them as Cancuns, and they looked they looked almost like um, like hyposonorans, you know, and that their color was a lot lighter, uh, the tails were lighter. I recall the, the ones I got came from uh, uh, Gus Renfro mm -hmm. and um, he had one that was like that. It looked like a hypo. Mm -hmm. And um, the two that I have are darker, they're darker snakes, but they have lots of really tight little circles down the back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. really close together, lots of circles. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, if you count, I should count them up, but if you count them, that's far more than most Imperator. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, I've seen those light ones. Um, I've seen ones photographed in the wild in Cancun that were very light. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of remind me of um, the mainland Belize boas do the same thing. I've got light ones and I've got dark ones. Mm -hmm. And same with the, um, the West Snake Cabo is I've got light ones and I've got dark ones. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Finn, I was excited to see that you're uh, working with uh, Viper Boas and breeding, producing those. I think you produced a couple litters last year, and I think you got a couple this year going. Yep. Yeah, those are really cool. Yeah, they're, they're just like a really cool little neat snake, you know? Yeah, to me, those are one that I could see getting lost in the hobby. There's a niche crowd that do like them, but they're almost like, uh, like Trachea Boa to me, like, you know, where... I could see one day people being like, damn, they were so available and I didn't get any. And now you can't find the damn things, you know? But they're kind of nippy as well, right? They're a little bit more pugnacious. Oh, definitely. Yeah, if anybody tells you they're really calm, they're lying. Yeah. yeah like whenever I'd seen them before, I remember one of them kind of just springing off the bottom of the cage. Yeah. It sprung that up and sprung really... apart, you know? It yeah. Was, yeah. That means they're really healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. If they're not doing that, there's yeah. something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I've kept them, but I never bred them yet. Don't get me wrong. I, I've had a few wild caught ones that, that I had that eventually did give me babies that were very calm. You could handle them and hold them. Mm -hmm. But most of the, the captive bred ones I have now are a little nippy, but you, you, you pick them up and enough, they kind of get used to you. Yeah. I, but if you I, just I like leave them. Yeah, I like any species that have such natural variation like that. Um, down in uh, Texas at Replandia, Ari and Quetzal have uh, this fire engine red animal. I mean, it's the kind the dreams are made of. It, it is just fire engine red. I was blown away when I saw that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some beautiful variants in it. Like I, over the years, I saw some that were like really hypomelanistic, really yellow. Yeah. And then the ones with fire engine red. And of course, the problem with them is that they bury themselves into the mulch or into this. Yeah. Thing. And then the tannins leaches, it seems to leach into their skin really easily. Yeah. And then they look like they look like just turds sitting there. And then they shed their skin. They look amazing for a handful of days. And then they go back yeah. to kind of being <laughs> dull. Well, the reason why the, the tannins are absorbed into their skin is because they literally yeah. are yeah. almost aquatic. Yeah. yeah. And they've shed maybe once or twice a year. Mm. So their skin gets, you know, the tannins from whatever they're in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that guy, um, my friend, um, Dan Malari, who's got, who goes to, uh, he goes to Erie and Jai all the time. Yeah. And uh, he's showed a video when he was in, um, 
Where was he? I think he was in uh, Sarong or one of those places, and he saw some uh, some little candoya on the on the ground, and they were soaking wet. I yeah. mean, like they're living in water. Yeah. And 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 I and I said to one of my buddies, I'm like, that's how they live. People think that I'm nuts, but they are almost aquatic, and they yeah. have peeled scales, so they don't they don't get blistered. They need moisture and water all the time. So. Yeah, yeah. So is there, whenever they shed, is their skin pretty thick that they shed? It is. It's really thick. I mean, yeah. you can could, you could stretch it out and, like, make a wallet out of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or cover yeah. leather with it and make a wallet. Yeah. And do they, do they feed readily? They feed fine, yeah. They, they, they are ravenous certain times of year. Again, they're seasonal feeders, too. Mm -hmm. Um and the the time of year then when they're hungry i feed them as much as they'll eat really yeah so um and again they need they need humidity if you dry them out you are done yeah and they're they small are, right so yeah. like what what's an what's an adult female like under the three biggest feet? one the biggest one i've ever seen was almost two feet yeah they're like, little that was like a big right? one. they're just like little blood pythons of the boa world Exactly. They're a tiny yeah. little blood python. Exactly. And you keep them the same way. They don't like it too hot. They don't like it too cold. Mm -hmm. They like a lot of humidity. Mm -hmm. They live in the same places where blood python. Well, similar, almost identical yeah. places. They yeah. live, I keep them like tree pythons, but on the ground, you know, mm -hmm. they live in the same place. They're great, great creatures and they're easy to breed. Super easy. Gestation is very long in six months. Wow, and they're born they're born really small, but mm -hmm. all of the viper boa babies eat pinkies, no problem, and they also shed the day they're born. The only other snake I have that did that were hognose snakes. Yeah, right. doomerals, doomeral boas will do that. Some yeah. sanzinia will sometimes do that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But you know, we we've had um, some Trinidad tree boas that um, shed the day they were born as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Really That's unusual, cool. yeah. Amazing, yeah. They're pretty cool. So, what what corallus are you keeping? You've got annulators, right? That's all I have right now. Yeah. Just the annulators. I have a couple of, you know, basins, and mm -hmm. but I put more of my energy into the tree pythons. It, it, it's weird. A couple of years ago, I had like, I'm like weighing out. What do I do? Do I do basins or do I do I do tree pythons? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I really like the tree pythons, and the basins were. The, to me, the ba at one point I regretted it. I'm like, I should have done the basins. But now I'm like, I'm glad I did the, the tree pythons because the basins are very easy to breed, at least to me. Mm -hmm. And I think they will be for other people. Mm -hmm. And I think they will be more common, hopefully more common in the future because of that. Yeah. Um, but I think the tree pythons, not too many people are doing them as regularly as you'd think. Yeah, you like, like I, I don't find emeralds difficult to breed at all. I think once right. you get healthy Basins animals, are even easier. Yeah, once Basins you get healthy animals, easier. then I think they're really easy. Um, and really I, think, you know, I think I think the pricing on on basins is just astronomical. Um, it, it's got to it's got to level off or adjust. I mean, those should be those should be like chondros. They should be fifteen hundred, twenty five hundred. Yeah. You know, that's what they should be. Yeah. You yeah. Know, five grand, maybe one with a lot of white on it, but yeah, it's just my opinion. But there's pe people out there listening and saying, this guy's an asshole. But <laughs> I've been doing this my whole life and I, and I, I see the waves, you know, I see the, mm -hmm. the ebbs and flows. And the one thing that, that, that I've seen is that the tree pythons that will always, will always be a, a little harder to breed, a little harder to get eggs to hatch, a little harder to get feeding, mm -hmm. a little hard, a little, a lot more discipline and care, and just enough to keep them a little more expensive. Mm -hmm. you know? Are you working with localities or, or are yours mixes or what have you got for your? I do mostly localities now. I had the, I had an OS, I still have an OS high yellow line, but they, they do, do not reproduce very very readily that's for sure mm -hmm. um the ones that reproduce best for me are all the localities the the arus the biox the sarongs they produce very nicely and mm -hmm. they incubate their own eggs which i don't even bother taking them away yeah i, I the, think um, morelia seem to be really good at that 
You know, they I really are. I mean, I, I don't know why no more people don't do it. it um, here, here's one of the issues that I've that I've come to grips with. For example, the OS high yellow green tree pythons. That bloodline originated from snakes that Eugene Eugene was friendly with a, a PhD, Dr. Van Mirop, who was doing the maternal incubation studies and he was he was doing it with, with Eugene because Eugene was a snake breeder. Mm -hmm. um, and they got in a gravid wild caught green tree python in 1976. And they let it incubate its eggs and they did all this study on it while it was doing it. And they hatched out the babies. Well, she hatched out the babies and they raised them up. So that was the, the start of his green tree python collection, mm -hmm. one gravid female. Mm -hmm. Then they added a lot of stuff to it later on. And keep in mind, just like I was saying when I was a kid, nobody knew the difference yeah. between green tree pythons. They right. didn't know the locality differences. Yeah. And now we know. Multiple species. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. there's three different. Well, there's it's two species. Two, and, and two, two species and four. Within. Yeah. Right. All yeah. together. So it's like those snakes are literally a three-way cross. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. You know, they t they have yellow in them, the OS stuff, so they must have used the BR. Mm -hmm. They have some blues and whites in them, so they must have used an Aru, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a lot of green in them, some of them, so they must have used the Maruki, you know, mm -hmm. which were the three things that were coming in in mm -hmm. the 70s and 80s, you know. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is those, those I'm going to call them mutts, for lack of a better yeah, yeah. term. Um <laughs> They don't know how to incubate their eggs because they, they've they lost their ability to do so. Hmm. So they don't incubate their eggs. Oh, wow. they, don't, they won't even bother. They scatter them everywhere. So once I started breeding the locality stuff back in like the, I guess it was the mid-90s, I was breeding Biox and some, some uh, Arus. Mm -hmm. I noticed they would lay their eggs and they'd be so coiled tight on them you couldn't get them. Yeah. So I would just leave them. Yeah. And they would hatch in 49 days like clockwork yeah. every time. And the babies would be born big and every one of them would eat. Mm -hmm. And then here I am with my OS stuff in the early 2000s from Eugene. They scatter the eggs everywhere. I incubate them myself. They take 53 days to hatch. Mm -hmm. They hatch and they don't want to eat. They barely eat. Mm -hmm. They're a little lethargic at first, but then they gain some strength. You know, it's like we can't incubate their eggs like they can. These yeah. these animals evolved for what hundreds of thousands of years incubating their own eggs, and we think we're going to do a better job. Yeah, I think you know, just watching uh, mm -hmm. a Morelia incubating an egg, watching it tighten its coils and loosen its yep. coils, Twitch. and then using Twitch. its head. To, sometimes you'll see it with its head poked right down into the coils, which yeah, I'm sure at that point is actually yeah. determining temperature. You know, yep. with pits, you know, and they just coil and they, they loosen up a little bit. They'll tighten up at other times. Mm -hmm. You know, they know exactly what what needs to be done. And we, yeah, we think we're, we can do it better by putting it into, into a fancy incubator. Right. You know, and, you know, I had a green tree python, a Wamina incubating its eggs. And I had a, we had a heat wave and I was in a I was in a warehouse that was made of metal. Mm -hmm. And no matter what I did, I couldn't cool this place down. And it was like over 90 in there. So I took the green tree python that was up high in a, in a cube type enclosure. And I put it on the floor, like the snakes was on the floor of its cage. So it was in contact with the floor yeah. of my warehouse, the concrete floor. And I'm like, this is all I can do. I just don't want those eggs to get above 90, you mm -hmm. know? Mm-hmm. So I thought she would like, like you said, loosen up and like try to cool off. Yeah. She did the opposite. She got tighter. Yeah. She got even tighter on them, yeah. but she must have been drawing some coolness off the floor, you yeah. know? Yeah. Because her coils went under the edge. Yeah, that's it. I've seen that yeah. happen before. It's really interesting. You know, they're almost in those, enclosing these eggs inside their coils. Right. Yeah. In a, like a be in like a beehive, you know? Yeah. They're yeah. in there. And they all hatched in 49 days, like clockwork. And I hear I was thinking I had a, a stent of almost a week of like 90 in that building. And another another scenario I had, um, we had uh, Hurricane Sandy mm -hmm. here in 2012. And, you lost and um, that was like September. 
So I'm running the whole, my whole warehouse on a generator with an oil fired heater to keep it yeah. at like 75 degrees. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing about that hurricane was we had a tropical storm one week and exactly a week later we had a snowstorm. Yeah. And I had no power for three weeks. Wow. So my, my warehouse is on a generator and the, the day of the, the storm, three female ball pythons laid eggs. It was like my late, my egg season. So instead of putting them in the incubator, I left them with the females. I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen with my incubator. So I might as well leave them with the females. Mm -hmm. But now here's the thing. Those cages had no three inch flex watt heat tape in the back. The CB 70 trays had no, I mean, it, it had the flex watt, but it wasn't on. Mm -hmm. I was just heating the whole building, not each individual rack. Like I would have. Mm -hmm. So they're at 75, 74, 72. One night I can't, I, I get to the, the warehouse and the generator's off. Something happened to it. Like a bolt rattled out of it and it turned off. The building was 56 degrees because we had a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. So I warmed the whole place up. Who knows how long it was that? It wasn't long, maybe a few hours. I warmed the place up and I'm like, those snakes on those eggs, those eggs are done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Those females were on eggs for three weeks with temperatures between, let's say, 60 and 75. Ambient temperature with no supplemental heat. Mm -hmm. They wrapped up tight on them. Every one of those clutches hatched in 60 days. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I had them written off like they're done. They're not going to, those aren't going to hatch. Every one of them had, three of them hatched. Yeah. So once that happened, I was like convinced maternal incubation is it, even though I'd barely do that with ball pythons, I just put them in the incubator because it's easier. Right. But like, you know, my carpet pythons, I'll leave them on the eggs. Mm -hmm. The Anteresia, I leave them on the eggs. Mm -hmm. the, the tree pythons, leave them all on the eggs. I don't even want to touch. I don't even want to look at them. Yeah. That's what I'm planning for, for my, uh, for my pythons. You know, I thought about setting up a new incubator and I think I'm just going to, just let them maternally incubate my anteresia and so on. That, why not? You know, as long as you can keep the humidity to a point where they're not going to dry out. And that's an, e that's an easy thing to do. If you do your hide in your nest boxes correctly, now I'm just going to leave them to do it naturally. You know? Yeah. More fun. And you know, the females create their own humidity in yeah. that coil. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like cup your hands together for an hour and they're going to be wet. Yeah. Right. You know, mm -hmm. You know, the first guy I met to do maternal incubation on his pythons was Bob Clark. Oh, yeah? I remember in the 80s, he was telling me, oh, I leave all the berms on their eggs. And I was like blown away. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. You know? Yeah, because I think if you look at some of the original pictures of the albinos hatching, the eggs right. are all like, they look, they're not pearly white eggs. They're, you can see that they've, they've been sitting in. Right. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, pretty cool. But well, that's the nice thing about boas. They do it themselves for us, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah that is uh, that is the, the nice thing. Well, it's good and it's bad because some of them leave something behind sometimes and then they have issues later. Right. Yeah. So have you had that happen often or not? Often? Every year, at least one. But I have a lot of animals. Yeah. You know, every year, at least one female will go into breeding mode, will look like she's ready to ovulate or will ovulate and something will go wrong. Mm -hmm. Something will either burst in there or something will happen and I'll find them dead. Right. I would say every other year I find one of those, one of those happens. Yeah. That, that's happened to me once and it was a Sonoran anarthristic and um, she had bred a hypomelanistic, you know, this is maybe 16 years ago. And, um, and she ovulated and she was sitting on the heat and I went away for a week to a meeting and I came back to my apartment and it smelled like death. Oh, God. And I'd had a litter of boas a couple of weeks earlier and there were just three little runts that were in and I thought I'd written them off. So I thought, well, these have died. No, no, it was that anarthristic Sonoran female that something must have ruptured and she was right. caught on the heat, you know, cooking away. Right. Oh my God! <laughs> Jeez! Oh, I, I, oh, I'm surprised uh, nobody came into my apartment to try and find out what 
the death smell. Find the, find the corpse that you left behind. <laughs> oh my goodness, you know. Yeah, from then on, I was very glad to have my own house after that, away from yeah. other people. Oh man, yeah. So that you know, there's that, and also, um, you know, retaining slugs. And I've seen this right. happen. Maybe you've seen it as well. You know, I've seen a female give birth, and in that in that uh, pile of babies, there's like one or two crusty old slugs that are, you know, that's from the year before, the year previous, or even prior to that. There, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I even had one drop a mummified baby. I've heard like a gray. People talk about that yeah, with I've heard people talk about that with Corallus, where they've had. I've had female. emeralds do that. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. a gray mummified baby from the year before or the year before that. Who knows? Yeah. It's, so yeah, they, they, you know, like well, a friend of mine said he's got a snake that has a retained um, egg in it. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, he's like, I want to bring it to a vet. I'm like, dude, just breed it. It'll pass it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> breed it and feed it and breed it again this, this coming season. And whatever's in there will come out. Yeah. Like I, I, I've had that. Um, like if I catch the female... I just just stop giving birth, and I I'll, I'll I'll palpate them all, and if I feel something in there, if it moves easily, then I'll palpate right. it out. But if it doesn't, I leave it. And again, yeah, it, yeah the next breeding season, I'm guaranteed to see that old crusty yeah. slug pop out. Yeah, yeah, it happened. And you'll also I've also seen this where, you know, female boas have two two ovaries. Mm -hmm. So one, one side will ovulate and then another one might ovulate. So they might ovulate two different times or they're both at the same time. Yeah. But what might happen sometimes is only one side ovulates. Yeah. The other side, the eggs get to a certain point and then stop. Yeah. And what I find out happens with that is the female will pass out a whole line of slugs and then a whole line of babies. Interesting. You know? Huh. So it's like, why did that the sperm not get to there? Was there a clog? Was there one left from the year before? Yeah, yeah. That maybe left that. Oh yeah, yeah. Slightly yeah, because, clogged. Yeah, because if the if the if the female, she has to ovulate for them to be released. If she doesn't ovulate, then those eggs will be reabsorbed. You know, right. people talk about eggs being reabsorbed after the females ovulated. They don't. If a female's ovulated, those those over are infertile. They got to come so, out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Whereas if the female doesn't ovulate, then those eggs will be will um, regress in size. They won't disappear and they won't be reabsorbed, but they'll regress in size. And then the year later, they'll inflate. Um, right. So it's uh, yeah, that's pretty fascinating. Hmm. Yeah, and they'll inflate, but they might not be able to be fertilized, so they right. got to come out. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So I see that too. But again, I see I, so many litters every year. I see everything. You know. Yeah. Interesting. You got any more questions, Keith? No, I think I'm good. Um, plus, I can hit Vin up on the side if I do. <laughs> yeah. We're coming up to two hours, and I don't want to keep Vin yeah. any longer. You know, this is a man that has to get up to go fishing at 6 a.m. So That's right. They still running good? The striper's still running good for you, Vin? No, they're not. No. <laughs> they're done now, I think. Well, yeah. The, the the issue we have is the the public beaches are getting crowded on the south shore of long island correction some are public some are are town or private so the one i go to is a town beach but it's not my town so after this weekend you need to be a resident to go there gotcha and and last weekend there was a car show at one of them and somebody left the car show <laughs> Out their tires and crashed their car and died. Oh wow! So now all the town beaches are closed <laughs> until Memorial Day weekend. Oh wow! Because they don't want the public at them with car shows. Right. So my secret spot <laughs> is, <done. laughs> is no longer available. So. All right. Well, it was great having you on, Vin. I appreciate your time. Uh, definitely a very interesting show. Definitely learned a lot about uh, different things. So that was very cool. Great. Yeah, Ben, right. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, it was good. We'll have to Anytime, do it again. Uh, we'll yeah, have to do a, bit, uh, a, a, a second episode of this one. Keep it going. We'll have Rob on next time. Yeah, sounds great. All right.
All right. So, so in, in closing, I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode of Boas, Boas, Boas with Warren uh, and myself. Please check uh, out the many shows on NPR Network and you, YouTube. Uh, listen on iTunes, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you may be using. For all the information, go to moralipythonradio.com. And we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. We're deciding what uh, the next episode will be, so we'll let you know as soon as we know. Until then, enjoy your animals and follow your passion, guys. Thank you.